And we will start with uh, um, David Matsu, uh, that is uh, an associate professor at the Department of Computer Science, the University of Pisa, where he leads the Pervasive Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. He holds a PhD in Computer Science and Engineering from the IMT Luca, for which he has been awarded the 2009 ER Caglianiello Prize for the best Italian PhD thesis on neural networks. So congratulations. Uh, and he has co-authored uh, over 140 research works uh, on deep neural networks, generative learning, Bayesian models, learning for graphs, continual learning, uh, and distributed and embedded learning systems. He has been the coordinator of several European, national, and industrial research projects. He is VP, former secretary and board member of the I Italian Association for AI, a senior member of the IEEE and vice chair of IEEE Neural Network Technical Committee. He is associate editor of the IEEE Transactions on Neural Networks and Learning Systems and chairs the IEEE CIS Task Force on Learning for Structural Data. The, the talk is uh, entitled Fundamentals of Reservoir Computing. So let's welcome our speaker. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Here you start. Uh, you can hear this simply. Uh, I don't destroy anything else in this room. Uh, okay, so I we have I've lost track of my mobile phone, so somebody scream at me when I'm going out of time. I've lost 15 minutes, but I'm going to be doing this as any academic professor. I'm going to be doing exactly the same amount of slides, but faster. Okay, so be ready for that. No, no, I'll try to be adaptive. And thank you for being here this time in the morning. I know how hard it is. I'm not a morning person at all. For the same reason, ask me a question. There's a chance you might keep me awake while I speak. Okay, so let's try and keep it sort of interactive. For, for, for the time. And this is going to be a didactic lesson. So something really introducing fundamentals of a, of a research field, of a research paradigm. Uh, it's the first of a, what cannot be called a series, but it's the first of two lectures. Uh, the second one is going to be tomorrow morning, which is more, uh, let's say, research oriented. So we're going to be talking more uh, research topics. So today is basically laying down the foundation. So this is uh, not working. So that's already a good start. Yeah, you heard enough of, uh, about me. So we skip this thing uh, and we get to the point. So today we speak about sequential data processing, basically. Okay, that, uh, Whatever we are introducing today is about how we can uh, process data, which is some sort of structure in it, namely information that is coming in time and do it with the most appropriate models for doing that. Where models, whenever you say me saying the overloaded word models, I would refer to a learning model, okay? In particular, we talk today about a paradigm for designing uh, neural networks, a specific let's say, type of neural networks, which are recurrent neural networks. That's what it's need to be done in, uh, in a smart energy consumption for a certain number of reasons. Certainly, sustainability is one of, the, of those, okay? Uh, AI is one of those fields that is heavily contributing to, to, to the melting of this planet because uh, it's particularly clear the amount of energy that we're draining, okay? And maybe it's also time that we stop doing all this... Uh, all this train for the sake of training stuff and, uh, and just to, to grasp a little bit of zero point nothing uh, percentage on the predictive, uh, on the predictive performance. Uh, just to make it a little bit uh, less serious, there are people complaining in papers that, you know, we had only 1.2 million uh, of hardware budget compared to Facebook, which had 4.1 million. Them. I mean, I, I feel sorry for them. So even I'm, I'm doing this kind of research also for these poor guys that have only 1.2 million US dollar 
budget than yeah and just sparing all the uh, all the other swear words that I have in my mind okay so uh, what's a deep neural network a deep neural network is a neural network with a lot of parameters uh, people would say it's a neural network with a lot of layers one after the other questionable anyway let's give a different formalization Deep learning is basically about picking up an architecture and the architecture induced, when I say architecture, architecture is one of those overloaded words that you change, you change uh, research area, it has completely different meaning. Topology of a neural network, okay, architecture, that's it. As soon as you pick up a topology of a neural network, you're implicitly imposing what is called an architectural bias. You're making the neural network more prone to solve one task over another, okay? And there's a certain number of choices that impose architectural biases. Not only the topology, is the initialization, is the range of the weights, is the type of uh, activation functions you use, is the uh, weight sharing choices. There's a lot of choices which are not driven by the learning algorithm, which is actually made by the programmer, okay, the designer, which impact strongly the kind of task the neural network can solve. Plus the learning algorithm, which is what adjusts the weights, does the magic and makes everything work. What I'm gonna be doing is cancel learning algorithms uh, uh, from the, from the uh, equation, at least for part of the network, which tells you that this leaves you with only the architectural bias, which means that you need to be careful in what you're doing. You need to know what you're doing because your network will only be as good to the task as the architectural bias that it has. Okay, so why I'm doing that? Because basically I want to find the trade-off between uh, in this uh, fake uh, complexity accuracy space in which, uh, well, poor linear models are down here. We all like it, slow complexity. Uh, sometimes they even have a decent accuracy, but that means that the task is probably too trivial. And stuff that is starts to be SVM, so kernel-based methods, and deep neural networks, which live far in heaven up there, high complexity, super accuracy. I want something here, okay? Accuracy that it nears the one of deep neural networks, but complexity that is definitely on the side of the linear modes. And the philosophy is exploit randomization. It's not only, it's not me that I'm saying that, okay? This is a famous paper, this one, this paper won the Test of the Time Award in Europe in 2017. So it's a, it's a prize that is given 10 years after the paper is published. The publishers sustain Test of the Time. These guys here basically propose one thing that is called the random, uh, random kitchen sinks. It's basically a theory uh, developed for kernel methods. But it's basically saying, you know what, you can go randomize projection and that, and that will work. Don't stop engineering crazy, crazy kernels and similarity functions and, and go for randomized projections. But it's a bit more articulated than that. I'm oversimplifying. But the, uh, the question is that they showed that things work both theoretically and practically when you use randomized project projections. Now, what's the intuition here? So the intuition is uh, basically sustained by covers theorem. Provided that you have a large enough high dimensional space, okay, you can take something that is, for instance, leaves in a smaller dimensional space, talking about vectorial spaces, okay? You take something that leaves, your information leaves in a reasonably small dimensional space. And it's very difficult to solve the problem there. For instance, it's very difficult to separate vectors into classes in that small dimensional space. I give you, a randomized basis, okay, a, a set of, uh, of vectors, okay, which are very big. And they project, well, they're very big, they're very, very many, and they project this uh, small dimensional sample into an high dimensional space through a random projection. Well, what we know is that there is a high chance that this randomized projection will spread things Okay, in such a way in which solving the problem in the high dimensional space is easier than solving it in the lower dimensional space, at least from a perspective of separating things. Of course, the problem is going to be more parameterized in a dimensional space. 
But from a, the perspective of solving the problem, it, it becomes easier. So the key thing here is leave the transformation of information, of input information to the magic internal representation of the neural network randomized, keep the space in which you represent your information large, and then put a very simple linear classifier on the top of it, which is the only thing you train. That's basically the intuition, okay? And why are we doing that? Because, well, randomization is efficient most of the time because we train less, we train fewer parts of the neural network, so the learning algorithms are cheaper, typically are simpler. Training a linear model is much simpler than training a linear model. Okay, you have exact solutions for that. Not need an iterative solution, for instance. Uh, if you want to think about it in terms of computational complexity or communication complexity, you don't need to transfer much data. Okay, good deal of your model is fixed. You just need to transfer the parameters that change, and the parameters that change are few with respect to the full size of the neural network. So this also makes it amenable to be used in embedded system or even in uh, dedicated hardware like neuromorphic hardware. Okay, and we're well, we're going to be talking about this in uh, in the lecture tomorrow. So let me just leave it there. Okay, so what's this structure? Let me check the time because I'm taking my time. Okay. Uh, so, what's the structure of this model? It's the structure of a neural network. So, you have an input, you have an output, okay? And you have something that is the internal representation of the neural network in the middle. It doesn't change anything with respect to the features that I've shown before. The key thing is that this part here is fixed. Meaning that, Remember that this was a parameterized, this one thing was a parameterized transformation of the input uh, uh, of the input of the input. It's still a parameterized transformation of the input, but the parameters are fixed. Okay? They are randomly generated, and that's it. You don't change them anymore. So there is going to be a set of parameters here, just as usual, but those are not learned. There is going to be a set of parameters here, maybe and those are fixed. This part up here, the readout layer, and which is another way of saying the output layer, has parameters, okay, computes the output by, uh, let's say, composing whatever function g, g is, which can be a nonlinear function, again, at an h, with the output of this hidden representation layer, okay? And just to make it simpler, simple, uh, what I can have is that, for instance, uh, I'm obtaining this transformation by uh, basically simply taking the input, transforming it to these fixed randomized features. Fixed randomized features means that this can be really a set of these random vectors in which you project things. Okay, can be a randomized uh, basis of vectors. And then I'm combining these randomized projections by some trainable parameters. That's a linear model, okay? It's just a linear combination of this pr projected stuff, okay? Uh, that's just, if you're wondering how I can obtain uh, this HI, I can obtain this HI, for instance, with this simple sigmoid-like stuff with the, with the parameters being randomly initialized. Now, there is no uh, recurrency yet. We're not talking about sequential data yet, uh, sequential data processing yet. Now I'm gonna be doing it. It's just, this was to introduce the model in general. And this is the model that is underlying a certain number of, uh, let's say, models that you will find in literature. Uh, these are the uh, random value function links, network, random kitchen sinks, extreme learning machines. These are all different type of neural networks, which are exactly the same neural networks actually in the end, because they do exactly the same thing. They randomize stuff, they project. Well, is it? Uh, are, are there kind 
two parameters for the randomized initialization that are based in data, or there is really no use of data? There is no you typically no use of data. There are hyperparameters, but there, these are not data dependent. That's a good point. I'm going to be showing you what's the thing you need to reason about, but it's not data dependent. That leads me to reservoir computing because that's where we start saying, okay, let's work with randomization in, uh, in a sequential data processing set. 